presidency had also uh, released a statement uh, appointing Dr. Ennis Addison as the incoming governor of the central bank. So tonight we'll be delving deeper into that subject uh, to find out uh, is it just a matter of politics or um, what could be, I mean, what could be the reason for the resignation of a central bank governor? You know that elsewhere in other countries, the resignation of a central bank governor has serious implications uh, uh, for the economy. So we'll look at that. We'll also speak to a former uh, deputy governor of the central bank, uh, Emmanuel Esiedumante, and get his views on that subject. Also tonight, we'll be looking at the uh, 2016 financial statement of Universal Merchant Bank. They posted quite some impressive results. Uh, I'll be hosting the... Uh, managing Director, the Chief Executive of Universal Merchant Bank, uh, Mr. John Iwa, on Business Focus. Uh, we'll also be speaking to the CEO and the Managing Director of Olam Limited. Uh, they, he will be on the Mover segment tonight. So we've got all these plus many more coming up. The very latest in, uh, on the commodities market as well as the stock market. We'll find out what the price of gold, cocoa and oil is and uh, a lot more coming up in the next uh, 15 minutes. My name is Parker Shesari. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. The presidency had also uh, released a statement uh, appointing Dr. Ennis Addison as the incoming governor of the central bank. So tonight we'll be delving deeper into that subject uh, to find out uh, is it just a matter of politics or um, what, could be, I mean, what could be the reason for the resignation of a central bank governor? You know that elsewhere in other countries the resignation of a central bank governor has serious implications uh, uh, for the economy. So we'll look at that. We'll also speak to a former uh, deputy governor of the central bank, uh, Emmanuel Esiedumante, and get his views on that subject. Also tonight we'll be looking at the uh, 2016 financial statement of Universal Merchant Bank. They posted quite some impressive results. Uh, I'll be hosting the uh, managing director, the chief executive of Universal Merchant Bank, uh, Mr. John Iwa, on business focus. Uh, we'll also be speaking to the CEO and the managing director of Olam Limited. Uh, they, he will be on the Mover segment tonight. So we've got all these plus many more coming up. The very latest in uh, on the commodities market as well as the stock market. We'll find out what the price of gold, cocoa, and oil is, and uh, a lot more coming up in the next uh, 15 minutes. My name is Parker Shesari. We'll take a short break. We're right back. presidency had also uh, released a statement uh, appointing Dr. Ennis Addison as the incoming governor of the central bank. So tonight we'll be delving deeper into that subject uh, to find out uh, is it just a matter of politics or um, what could be, I mean, what could be the reason for the resignation of a central bank governor? You know that elsewhere in other countries, the resignation of a central bank governor has serious implications uh, uh, for the economy. So we'll look at that. We'll also speak to a former uh, deputy governor of the central bank, uh, Emmanuel Esiedumante, and get his views on that subject. Also tonight, we'll be looking at the uh, 2016 financial statement of Universal Merchant Bank. They posted quite some impressive results. Uh, I'll be hosting the uh, managing director, the chief executive of Universal Merchant Bank, uh, Mr. John Iwa on Business Focus. Uh, we'll also be speaking to the CEO and the Managing Director of Olam Limited. Uh, they, he will be on the Mover segment tonight. So we've got all these plus many more coming up. The very latest in, uh, on the commodities market as well as the stock market. We'll find out what the price of gold, cocoa and oil is and uh, a lot more coming up in the next uh, 15 minutes. My name is Parker Shesari. We'll take a short break. We're right back.
All right, sure. Welcome back to Movers. Uh, you're welcome back to Business Focus, your weekly business and economic analysis. The industrial, uh, transforming the industrialization of Ghana. And we would like to play our part and grow with the Ghanaian growth. What we need is an enabling environment. And I was uh, highlighting, Minister, that, uh, you know, the regional market is available for exports. And we could focus and we could uh, grow. Any, anybody can grow and focusing on exports. Uh, to say that whatever the tax and duties of the land, we are uh, this one, and I believe that as a government which wants to promote industry, they will have their tax policy which will make the local industries competitive. And that's our firm belief, and, uh, and I, I am very happy to state that uh, Ghana is progressing in the right uh, direction with the recent uh, you know, the tax cuts announced. Singapore Trade and Industry Minister Dr. Kopun Kun also believes Ghana has great business potential. Ghana is in the face of rapid development. There are many sectors that have opportunities, whether it's in the urban development, and I think the minister himself highlighted 10 points earlier in his speech. These are all areas, whether it's in tourism, oil and gas, whether it is in urban development, whether it's in logistics, port management, for example. These are all areas where Singapore company has contributed in some small ways in the past. And I think as a, an agro-industry as well, like Olam, so I think you know, food processing, how to move the processing and manufacturing up the value chain. These are things that Singapore companies uh, are always on the constant lookout for. And I think as Ghana's uh, plans develop, we will continue to communicate between our two ministries and see how we can facilitate some of these link-ups between a Singapore company and a local partner. As I said earlier, it's important for us to work with a local partner and to do some degree of software transfer as well. It's not just about us being here and bringing everything here. Singapore is too small to do that. We need to leverage on the strength of our brother here to, do, to succeed together, so to speak. So this is what we're going to do. On government's part, it remains determined to decentralize its industrial sector to make Ghana a manufacturing hub. If you give us two, three years, this country will begin now to realize that we are producing graduates, particularly those from the vocational schools, who will feed directly into specific areas uh, and sectors that government has already identified uh, to be uh, important in, in our industrial development agenda. Uh, unless, that, uh, unless you do that, then it means you are just training people for training sake. And, and that education becomes an end in itself. We want education to become a means to an end. And so once we've identified the sectors that we'd like to support, we will now then work with uh, uh, our educational institutions to now tailor their curriculum uh, to support industrial development. But beyond that, a lot of skills training actually goes on in the factories and, and then in the industrial establishment. Olam Ghana are producers of quality food products including Royal Feast perfumed rice, Tasty Tom tomato paste and Royal Aroma perfumed rice. The company has also investment in the agriculture sector. All right, you welcome back to Business Focus, your weekly business and economic analysis program. Gone by is our mover of the week and you have the managing director and chief executive officer of Olam Limited. We're going to go for a short break. When we return, we'll talk about our main subject for the night, and it's got to do with the resignation of the central bank governor, uh, Dr. Nashiro Itzahaku. When I return, I'll introduce you to you, uh, the dean of the Graduate School of Business at the University of Professional Studies, Accra, and also uh, Ben Amwa. He's an analyst with First Bank Financial Services. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back from that commercial break. And so we're going to start with a, a very topical subject, uh, which has to do with the resignation of the central bank governor and the appointment of a new one. Uh, let me cross over live to my colleague, Rabi Alassan. He's been speaking to uh, a former deputy governor of the central bank, uh, Emmanuel Esirimante. There have been some swift movements at the Bank of Ghana recently with the nomination of Ernest Addison as governor of the Bank of Ghana.
This follows the less than 11 months stay as governor of the Bank of Ghana by Dr. Nashiru Ishaku. Now I'm being joined here by Mr. Esiedu Mante, who is a former um, deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, to share his perspectives on what some have called swift movement that could possibly send some shock waves across the economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Isio Dimante, for joining us on Business Focus. Thank you for, for having me on your program. What do you make of the movements in the Bank of Ghana uh, with uh, the resignation of Dr. Nasir Haku and the appointment of Ernest Addison as governor? Well, you, you describe it as swift. Um, swift may be because of the rapid movement of governors. Normally, um, it shouldn't happen because the law, the Bank of Ghana law, as well as the constitution of the country states specifically that a governor's term is four years. Governor takes office for four years. And, uh, and therefore, if somebody doesn't do the four years, you could say it's a rapid movement. To that extent, yes, uh, because uh, the outgoing governor did about one year approximately. But um, what I can say about it is that the incoming governor is equally good. In fact, I, I've known uh, Dr. Addison for quite a, uh, a long time. He was formerly the uh, head of director of research department. So he knows his way around. He knows central banking. He's not new to central banking. And uh, I don't think he will have any problems. Were you expecting the resignation of Dr. Nasir Ishaku? Well, I wasn't expecting it, but it has, it has happened. Uh, the reason he gave, the official reason, is that it's for personal reasons. I think he and he alone can tell, you know, why, why he's had to leave so abruptly. What we should be concerned about, really, uh, is whether the work of the bank will be adversely affected. Is it expected that maybe the resignation in less than 11 months could send wrong signals to investors? No, I don't think so. As long as the incoming one is pursuing the same policies as enshrined in the Bank of Ghana law, I don't think any, any investor will be, be panicking. Let, let's look at um, Dr. Nasir Haku and the time he spent with the Bank of Ghana as governor. What, what do you make of how he managed to stay at first, uh, the performance of the city, as you mentioned, and generally how he comported and managed the Bank of Ghana and our monetary policy issues? I think he did very well. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the exchange rate is stabilized now. Uh, the city was galloping against the dollar, but now it's stabilized. And then inflation is also trending down. And this is what Bank of Ghana is judged with, you know. Once you're able to maintain the value of the currency, the exchange rate is stable, then the central bank is doing well. And there's no, the other one is uh, when there's no, um, any, any unusual development in the financial sector, then it means the supervision part of the Bank of Ghana is also doing a great job. So I think he did well, and he, to the best of his ability, within the one year period he's been governor. Okay. Now let's look at... Uh, Mr. Ernest Addison, coming in as former head of research at the Bank of Ghana. Currently, he is with EFDB. Um, what, what do you expect him? How do you expect him to fit in when he comes uh, as governor? And what, what are the first things you should be looking at? Like I said, you know, he's not new to Bank of Ghana. He's not new to central banking. But the only thing I'll say is that, you know, he, for, for, as a monetary authority for the central bank to be effective in its, its functions, it needs to work closely with the fiscal authority, that's the Ministry of Finance. It also has to lace with the external bodies like the IMF, the World Bank, African Development Bank. And he's familiar with all these institutions, right? And he should be able to mo motivate his staff also to work for him, because that's what management is all about. And motivation here is not only in reference to money, you know, uh, you must be able to get the best out of your, your, your staff. At the end of the day, they do the speed work anyway. Okay. So we know the finance ministry would always be dealing with the fiscal side of things, whilst the Bank of Ghana deals with the monetary side of things. But time without number, there's this issue of how 
um, the overbearing influence of uh, the politicians and the executive is brought to bear on the Bank of Ghana. I'm, I'm sure you know about 2012 where concerns were raised about the fiscal indiscipline that we witnessed and the impact we've seen on the economy. This governor is going to stand up to again the Ministry of Finance and is going to stand up to the politicians to rein them in to do the right things. Do you think he can do that because we've seen some failures in the past? Well, well you see the the most people are not aware that on the board of Bank of Ghana sits the Deputy Minister of Finance. The idea is that the two institutions, the Fiscal Authority, Monetary Authority, should work hand in hand. So at any point in time, the Deputy Minister of Finance is on the board of the Bank of Ghana. And you recall I told you earlier that there must be collaboration, effective one, between the two authorities, Monetary Authority and Fiscal Authority. When they work closely, then you avoid uh, any of those uh, things you are describing. Okay. Now, let's talk about the city also. So far this year, um, we've seen the city kind of stabilize, but in the beginning of the year, it was depreciating um, considerably against the US dollar and the other major trading currencies. We heard of some auctioning of some dollars at the Bank of Ghana that has led to some stability. But there are worries from some financial analysts that we should allow the city to take its normal level against the dollar and not be preparing it with some release of dollars into the system. What is your position on that? Well, it's part of in intervention in the market is part of Bank of Ghana's uh, role, right? If Bank of Ghana has reason to believe that the city is sliding precipitously, Bank of Ghana has the right to intervene in the market. All right, so that was uh, my colleague Rabiu Al Hassan uh, speaking there to a former deputy governor of the central bank, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Isia Dumante, on the resignation of Dr. Nashiru Isahaku and the, um, the appointment of Dr. Um, Addison as the new governor of the central bank. Uh, let me just quickly engage you with my uh, list, uh, my panelist. Um, I've got Ben Amwa, he's an analyst with First Bank Financial Services, and also Dr. John Mauli Kwekumens, as a dean of the Graduate School of Business at the University of Professional Studies in Accra. Good evening, gentlemen, and thanks very much for your time. I'll start off with you, uh, Ben. Uh, did you expect the resignation of Nashiru, Doc? Um, yes, I think it was fairly obvious. Because I think from the very beginning there were calls for his resignation, even though he hadn't stated as much, uh, and not just from you know the usual political <laughs> um, gentlemen. We were, see, we were hearing calls from even such distinguished individuals. Even stalwarts from yes, the uh, including uh, Dr. Incumbent. Antonio Seiko. Right. Yeah, and he ha he actually stated quite clearly that he think it behoves the man to resign because he didn't think it was appropriate for him to keep his position. So I think it was it was something that was fairly in the works, mm. and we we are not really we are not really. I'm going to come well. back to you uh, on what this really means uh, going forward. But Doc, let me uh, quickly get you also to respond to this matter. Uh, we know that the Bank of Ghana Act, as well as the Constitution, uh, guarantees a four-year tenure, yeah. a four-year term for the Bank of Ghana governor. Uh, seeing that he has had to resign upon the resumption of power of a new government, what does it mean? Um, that is the provision for the tenor, okay, and I don't think the constitution restricts or restrains anyone from resigning. Mm. Um, but the most important thing is that, um, why? Just as my colleague has uh, mm. probably responded. Well, he stated yeah. that he's had to resign for very personal reasons. We don't know what the personal uh, reasons are. I mean, we are all surprised. Mm. In fact, um, I wasn't expecting it. Um, he was still in control, he was in charge. Um, he started 2017 very well. We were all worried, but it seems um, he was in control. We saw the um, CD um, when he started depreciating, then suddenly started uh, appreciating against the dollar and the other mm. uh, currencies. Um, inflation has been watered down. We also witnessed a downtrend in inflation for some time now, when he took over. Um, and for the first time within 10 years, our monetary policy has reduced by 2%. 200 I mean, basis points, yeah, right. I mean, um, personally, I was surprised to hear about uh, his resignation. Um, we thought 
I mean, from academia, I, I, we expect that uh, there should be some continuity. You know, in, in the history of uh, Bank of Ghana, I think apart from um, Agama, um, who is one of the longest serving uh, governors, uh, it's uh, Dr. Paul Aqua. Dr. Paul, yeah. And, 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 and ever since we had and, lots and, of truncations. Yeah, and during the tenure of Paul Aqua, you realize the trend. He worked for a long time. He was able to steady the system, stabilize the system. Before he left, I mean, we have very good indicators. I okay. think within the NDC uh, eight years, we've had quite a number of people <laughs> occupy that seat. Yes, uh, there was, was first Emisa, uh, Emisa Arthur, Arthur, Arthur first, and then yeah. he was moved to the vice president. To the vice president, yeah. so one part had to take, had to take over. And he one part didn't allow his term to expire, yeah. <laughs> and then he stepped down. And then and Nashiru they had to came in. So Nashiru. we've seen quite. What does this mean for monetary policy? Um, well, in 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 theoretical terms, we would mm. say it's bad because there's always. There, there always has to be this um, need for central bank independence. And usually when politicians, you know, tend to push governors in or out of their positions, then it really creates the impression that the central bank isn't really independent. The impression is that you are trying to put somebody you want there so you can get the things you want. But it's bad in itself. But the truth is also that we haven't really seen that, you know, play out in financial markets in Ghana. And so, for instance, after Dr. Wang, um, Dr. Nashiru uh, re resigned on Thursday. The city has gained against all the middle trading currencies, including uh, the Japanese. Is, is that a consequence of his regulation? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I mean, in, in, theor in theoretical terms, mm. we expect that because of that, of that mm. resignation and because the major of effects on the money market, we expect the city to yeah. sink. Mm. You know, uh, for our bond yields to rise mm. on the financial markets, the opposite is rather happening, mm. and it's just a continuation of a trend of something that has been happening over the last three so or four weeks. So you don't necessarily want to. Uh, link that to the governor. Exactly. Mm. So we can't really say that in Ghana, if you sack the governor, okay, or if the governor resigns, mm. you know, unceremoniously, <laughs> it puts our financial markets at risk. Even though we would all prefer that, you know, there is that continuity. It's, it's good because when somebody stays in a position for a long time, they learn more on the job. I mean, you could have worked as head of, re head of research in the Bank of Ghana for a very long time, mm. but really you don't you don't know what it means to be so. So it brings us to the subject of uh, political governance. If there's any any word like that, well, uh, politics and governance really, what are the dynamics? Mm -hmm. The dynamics are that there's always the risk that the finance minister or the president can bring you know some pressure to bear on the governor to do the things that he or she wants them to do. Um, like he mentioned in 2012, there was an issue about the central bank financing the government's huge deficit mm. and we also what that did to our economy over mm. the next three years mm. i mean we are recovering from that now yeah. and we have in power a government that intends to you know push on a lot of policies and a, a, a lot of programs that that's earmarked in the budget the risk is that if somehow revenue shortfalls begin to appear in the budget there's the risk that there will be pressure on the governor to you know finance <laughs> all those things but hope 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 uh, we should just hope that you know that everybody will behave as professionally as possible listen guys <laughs> I, aren't you all trying to play mr nice man and gentlemanly <laughs> why are we pretending the man really resigned i mean he was pushed out we you see the thing about the central bank governor is mm. you can't sack him like mm. you said yourself he has yeah. a four-year tenure yeah. right so Unless he himself is nice, you can't really kick him out. You, you also so what? You so can push uh, him out. behind <laughs> the scenes negotiations? And I think that happens everywhere in, 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 in any position. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some positions that the president can just come and give you a letter and say, I mean, Like resign. Cocoa Board, for instance. Uh, like okay. Cocoa Board, for instance. Mm -hmm. And there are several other positions like mm -hmm. that. There are some where even, the president, even if the president has not given you a letter, you yourself, you should know that your term has ended. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you're a deputy minister or you're a regional minister, mm -hmm. that as soon as your government changes power, you know automatically that you've lost your job. Mm -hmm. But this is the case where they can't sack him. Now, as to whether he was pushed out or he decided to resign based on his own... The, and the truth is, all, is also that he has already been aligned with the previous, go right. with the, with the previous government. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been news going on in Ghana ever since his appointment that he was a member of the NDC. Um, so even if he is not pushed out, I think personally he might decide if my political ideology is not aligned with this government, it would be appropriate But did that impact on out. his work as central bank governor? Did we see that happen? It shouldn't, naturally. Mm. But then, you know, we are all human beings. And the risk is that, you know, like you said, political star was within the MPP. Mm. For instance, if the city starts mm. depreciating, mm. what's to say somebody is not going to say he is deliberately sabotaging the new government? Mm. 
Mm. Do, you, do you get that? Mm. And again, somebody made a very good point. If he resigns, he's resigning on his current salary. Mm. So what's the point anyway? Mm. 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 Why stay there and take the blame for things you didn't do or have your hands tied with things you would want to do mm. when you can just resign and have So the whole else? cultural setting doesn't exactly. allow for him to so stay So it, it's not any fixed further. that he was mm. pushed out. Mm. But I think even naturally, he himself would wake up one morning and say, I do not fit into this role mm. because of the current government. And it would be wise for him to just step down. Mm. So, so we are certain that uh, upon the resumption of another government, Dr. Addison will also uh, gladly resign <laughs> in this position, won't um, um, it's, it's very, very important. Mm. No, very, very, very important here. Yeah. Um, you see, every government and its economic ideologies, mm. and I know very well that this government, or this particular governor also knows the ideologies of the NDC government. Mm. You made a very strong point here. If, if this man is to stay, then we, we, we have some downturn in various you know, indicators. You would have heard what everybody would say. Mm. The man is sabotaging the, 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 the Nana Pufado's government. Mm. And that's usual. Mm. But you see, um, very, very important issues like um, management of the currency against the foreign currencies, um, management of some other financial, you know, uh, um, 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 policies require very experienced people, very, very experienced people. Now, um, the next issue is to ask who the next, the new mm. governor is. Mm. Who is he? Um, what is he coming to do? And what are the expectations of Ghanaians? I, I always want to put my shoes in, I mean, the, the, that of the, the populace, the masses, the business sector. Are they really worried? Not worry. They have an expectation that uh, this governor should stabilize the city against the dollar and other. You know, the dollar is one of the dominant uh, foreign currencies that we trade with, mm. and other you know foreign currencies. And um, the the new governor should be able to, um, especially the supervisional role, supervisory role. Um, one of the issues that hit this man so hard has to do with the DKM issue. Mm. The, you know, as part of one of the rules of the central bank has to do with uh, managing risk, and that's the, that's how they do through their mm. supervisory role. Right. And and if 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 you miss out of this, then the whole economy will go down. Um, if you know the impact of what DKM, I mean, cost to the farmers, the few business guys in the, uh, I mean, Brown Half and the Northern region, you'll be amazed. So, so we, we are expecting a new governor who is going to stabilize our system and also play the critical role of supervising the, the various financial institutions mm. like the microfinances, the rural banks, where supervision is so difficult. How many times do we have um, the, the Bank of Ghana supervising some of these institutions? Uh, we, need, we need this man to probably come in to stabilize all the systems for us. Mm. Mm. Uh, ben, uh, so it appeared all dramatic. Uh, we got that letter talking mm -hmm. about him resigning for personal reasons. Mm -hmm. In less than 24 hours, the presidency uh, tells us how it regrets <laughs> the, 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 the resignation of the, See, the central bank <laughs> governor. And then, you know, tells us that it's appointed a new person, Dr. Addison. So what's the way forward for the central bank? Um, I think... Uh, Dr. Addison, I didn't know him before now, mm. but I've read a little about his work in mm. the central bank mm. you know, since the early two, 2000s. And I think he deserves the role, um, particularly in a time like this. Why do I say so? He is a monetary expert. Yeah. Now, the key risk to any of the policies that the central bank takes, mm. including the policy rates, is inflation, which is largely driven by exchange rates volatility, right. you know, the city's performance against the major trading currencies. Mm. We need, at the helm, somebody who understands and can manage that situation for us. Because mm. it seems to be the key risk to our economy going forward. Mm. And I think that it's appropriate that somebody who has that strength should come in there. He has actually chaired the West African Monetary Institute yeah. for some time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like a huge role. Right. You know, those were the individuals who were trying to, or who are still trying to <laughs> get all the, you know, a common currency for the West African English-speaking states. Mm. So that's a very good appointment mm. so to speak and he has experience again at the central bank mm. so yeah. it's not like it's a new place for him he knows most of the people there already from his so, work in so the past. we can almost anticipate another uh, you know uh, 
appointment because uh, again there are rumors making the rounds that uh, a certain uh, Kelly Gajapo is likely to uh, be appointed uh, deputy governor. Mind you, uh, uh, Mr. Na uh, is almost near retirement. Yes, almost so near retirement. Yes. It's likely you know he might you know um, you know uh, you know exit his term mm -hmm. uh, hopefully next year thereabout or maybe pretty soon and then would we'll have. Uh, somebody appointed in as a deputy governor. But, uh, Doc, uh, what's the way forward for the, the, the central bank? Okay, um, the way forward. Um, for Dr. Addison, um, we only have some expectations, yeah. apart from his experience in, yeah. in um, monitoring financial issues. To the Ghanaian, we expect that uh, Dr. Addison understands the private sector. Mm. Because if you have a governor who does not understand the private, and don't forget, this government policy is geared towards developing and boosting our GDP through the private sector. Mm. It, I mean, they, they, from day one, it's evidence that that's mm. what they want to do. Mm. So this man must understand the private sector. Um, Dr. Addison must also understand government issues on financial policies. Now, what is the, what, what the government stands on some of these, you know, policies. He must understand them. And that is a, a, a normal expectation. Um, then one major issue has to do with currency management. Mm -hmm. In fact, he should manage our currency very well. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if our city continues to depreciate, it's going to affect all the other indicators, especially inflation. And don't forget, um, our, our, our sector is dominated by the service industry. And just as we all know, we depend on the foreign currency. So if he doesn't manage it well, we are down. Now, most importantly, um, that has to do with the monetary policy. In fact, um, a, a quick observation of, of, of the trend over the years um, is that we use the monetary policy to control inflation. inflation. Apart from that, it doesn't really affect the other ones. We mm -hmm. try to use it, Yeah, I mean, we, we only try to use it. So if, if we even have uh, an economy where the, 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 the real interest rate is, is not reflective of, 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 of the monetary policy itself, mm. then I think we have a problem. And currently, despite the reduction, we are still among the highest, you know, uh, non-friendly, uh, you know, businesses. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, then, uh, the do we expect yeah. any major changes in yeah. uh, monetary policy direction? I think we are in a very clear direction now. Mm. I think, like you said, this government is trying to drive private sector development. And one of the key things that should help that is monetary policy loosening. And so we should expect further declines in the policy rates going forward, especially if inflation remains as stable as we've seen it yeah. over the last 12 months. So yeah, monetary policy should remain on a downward trend. Let me just put it that way. Yeah. All right, All right gentlemen, I've got to say a big thank you to you, um, to Dr. Uh, Kweku Maoli Mensa, the Dean of Graduate School of the uh, University of Professional Studies in Accra, and also to you, Ben J, who's an analyst with First Bank Financial Services. Uh, we'll go for a short commercial break. When we return, I would host the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Universal Merchant Bank. Uh, they've just uh, announced their financials for the year 2016, and we'll be delving deeper into that. But uh, just before we go on this commercial break, uh, there's just some uh, breaking news story that's coming in. We understand transport fares have been increased by 15%. Effective Thursday, 6th April 2017. Transport fares have been increased by some 15%. Effective Thursday, 6th April 2017. Now, the transport union say they took into consideration several factors before arriving at the percentage increment. Now, the increment was arrived at at a meeting on Monday uh, between stakeholders such as the Ministry of Transport, the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, and the Ghana Road, Tran Ghana Road Transport Coordinating Council. In Accra. So that's just some breaking news story coming in. Uh, let's go for a short break. When we return, John Iwa, uh, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Universal Merchant Bank, is my guest. All right, welcome back to Business Focus, your weekly business and economic analysis program. I've been joined in the studio by uh, two gentlemen. Uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Investment Merchant Bank, John Ewa, as well as Kwame Ej uh, Ajivon. I, I, I hope I got Ajivon. that name right. Ajivon. The Chief Finance Officer yes. at uh, Universal Merchant Bank. And uh, 
We're going to be talking about the uh, release of the 2016 financials of the company. Um, so I'll start off with the Chief Finance Officer, um, Kwame E.J. Ajivon. Ajivon yes. Right. So what accounted for the profit you recorded in 2016? Well, it was predominantly driven by a significant growth in our earning asset. Uh, our earning asset grew by about 97%. Uh, that actually led to about 45 percent increase in our net interest income. Uh, we also were able to reduce our impairment line by almost 90 percent. And of course, we've I uh, a very tight control over our operating expenses. That was able to basically um, turn our situation. Uh, in fact, for the past five years, I mean, we've been a loss-making bank. And so these are the key drivers of our performance for last year. And uh, it's good you talk about the, the, the last five years, because I'm just going to ask uh, how that compares to the previous year, 2015. 2015, uh, we made a loss of uh, almost $7 million. Uh, This year, we made a profit around $20 million. That was more than 450% increase. Oh, so you had enough to even support uh, the president's uh, uh, one district, one factory policy? Yes, yes. Good, yes. good, good. Uh, Mr. Wa, uh, uh, what were the key positive results from your financials? Um, I, would, I would like to just take a step back mm. and uh, just put some ammunition or uh, some baseline mm. to the numbers that um, we record, recorded. Um, the last two years, we've invested quite heavily in the bank and all our investments were geared towards building the bank to last for the future. So uh, profitability is an end result. Mm. Uh, it was not an immediate objective of the bank. The immediate objective of the bank was to transform our operating infrastructure, invest a lot more in the areas that will help us grow and also be at the forefront of customer excitement. Mm. So we are not surprised at the results that um, we came out with last year mm. because a lot of work had gone on behind the scenes in terms of building the operating infrastructure, mm. investing heavily in people, investing in systems, and also uh, ensuring that we are at the forefront of customer needs. And that is how we build uh, our brand. Um, at UMB, we say every time that we don't sell a product, we sell a service. Mm. And then through our customer service, customers ask for products. Mm. So that is our, we turn it upside down. Mm. We don't go telling people that this is what we have to offer. Mm. We go telling people that this is our service delivery. This is what we can deliver mm. to the customer in terms mm. of expectation. Mm. Indeed, your chief finance officer talked about uh, the reduction in operating expenses and also uh, impairment losses. Um, you and I know that one of the difficulties in the uh, financial uh, industry over the years, or particularly for last year, has been the uh, non-performing loans ratio, which uh, had gone up quite uh, significantly. How did you manage to deal with that? Um, you know, if assets don't just go bad, mm. you know, from day one, you need to ensure that the assets or the loans that you're putting on your books are loans that mm. will be recoverable in the future. So what we have, as I said, I'm t I'll take you again to two mm. years before, mm. that what did we do in terms of um, improving the credit culture in the bank? Mm. Uh, we have invested in systems. Mm. We have invested in Moody's analytics that mm. helps us to undertake proper credit sanctioning. Mm. So when we put an asset on the books, we have very high hopes mm. and beliefs that through the sanctioning process, we have been able to uh, give the loan to the person who actually needs the loan mm. and who has the capacity to... But, but does to, it really to, matter to what systems you, you put in it place? For, for as long as you have interest rates skyrocketing... It, it matters a lot. So mm. it's all part, part of it. If mm. uh, the, the person's cash flow pro, uh, projection mm. is such that if interest rate is at a certain level and mm. you cannot afford it, you don't force the loan down the truth of the customer. Okay. Because if you are treating the customer fairly, mm. one, one key uh, the deliverable of that exercise mm. is to also ensure that the customer is well informed mm. and, and that customers who are taking facilities mm. are those who need facilities. Right. We've seen in this market mm. where banks have rather collapsed businesses mm. because they did not provide the right solution to the, mm. to, uh, to the customers. Mm. And at, at UMB, because mm. of our heavy investment in mm. the things that helps us in our decision-making process, right. we have been better able to manage our impairment. Uh, levels that you have. Kwame, uh, we've seen your deficit levels increase uh, to some 57%. Uh, what would you say contributed to this growth and uh, how do you ex uh, 
plan exceeding this target in 2017? Oh, it's, it was absolutely true hard work. Uh, mm. Putting a lot of uh, um, aggression on ourselves, mm. pushing ourselves, uh, and of course, at the end of the day, also ensuring that uh, we provide I mean, the kind of things our customers need mm. uh, to be able to feel comfortable I mean, placing their deposit return. Because at the end of the day, if they don't feel that their deposits are safe, I mean, it becomes very difficult for them to uh, place, uh, have a trust, and then place uh, such uh, amount of uh, funds I mean, with you. So, mm. Mr. Ward, so I, I know work. every company has a mission statement, and uh, every year most companies come out with a focus. I'm sure you also have a focus for the year 2017. What are you particularly focusing on for this year? Our theme for this year is enhancing, enhancing um, customer um, experience. Mm. So everything is at the customer is at the heart, at the heart mm. of everything that we set out to do this year. But if you have followed us in recent past, you mm. find that we are focusing quite massively on the small and medium scale enterprises. Mm. We recently launched our uh, UMB Center for Businesses in Kumasi, mm. which is a facility that is 100% dedicated to um, small and medium enterprises. Yeah. We'll be opening one in the coming days in Accra at Mandina. Then in about a month or two, we'll be opening the version in Kasua. All these have been, all these investments have been geared towards um, facilitating our relationship with our customers such mm -hmm. that it is not just about loans and deposits, it's about the customer being a part of our business planning mm -hmm. and uh, being at the forefront of all the decisions that mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we make. If you enter our uh, center for businesses, mm -hmm. it's not just a distribution point, it's a place where we invite customers, non-customers as well, for free training. Mm -hmm. we, we give them um, um, hands-on exposure to things, basic things that can cause business disruption and that can cause their businesses to fail. We are there to grow the businesses. We have our plan to move from where we are as a bank to be one of the topmost banks in the country by 2020. If you want to do that, you need businesses to drive and grow alongside the bank. So our investments in all the infrastructure setup, both digital and physical infrastructure, has been at the fact that we want to bring customers along with us. And the customers that we see as small businesses now are the big businesses of the future. So at UMB, we say every time, that small businesses means big businesses to us. And, and that is exactly what we have set up. We are very, very focused mm. in what we are doing mm. in terms mm. of the things that we want to exert our energies on to drive value for the bank. Right, so quite apart beyond your customers, uh, what you shareholders expect from the bank? Um, shareholders should be happy that the bank is in good hands uh, and we've turned the corner. It is always good to talk about a performance which is positive. Um, it's not easy in an economy where things slowed down significantly in 2016 to grow a deposit by over 50%. Mm. This is a 45-year-old mm. bank. And if you can still grow deposit by over 50%, I think you, you deserve a, a, a pat on your back. Mm. So we are building the bank to last. We are not rushing in running for profitability. We are building the infrastructure that to put the bank on a level for future growth and to also be the bank of choice for our customers. And that is why you heard us when we visited the president that we share 100% in the vision of the president in terms of the one district, one factory. It feeds a lot into our long-term plan of growing of our enterprises, growing of our small businesses. That is so it's not something that just came out of the curve because we identified that our strategy is just going directly in line with the vision that the president has set for the nation. And you're dedicating some $100 million dollars yes, to start off with? It's not a donation, but it's a liquidity space that we have created for mm -hmm. businesses that would want to take advantage of this laudable idea to help expand the economy, to create jobs for our youth, and also to enhance the economic prosperity uh, um, of the of the country as a whole, mm. we will be beneficiaries of a successful outcome mm. of this project. Mm. Uh, Kwame, I did ask your boss about the uh, non-performing loans and how the bank is dealing with that. Would you like to expatiate a lot more on that? Well, I think John has basically said all that needs to be said. Uh, just to reinforce what he said, uh, it's not just a matter of basically having systems, but it's also a matter of also making sure that certain values are inculcated in those who are basically involved in the credit I mean, sanctioning process. And how, so, how well are you collaborating with credit referencing bureaus? 
Oh, we do. I mean, before we even I mean, sanction a credit, I mean, that's the first place that we go, just to ensure that any customer that we are dealing with, basically, it's not a customer that has created any credit issues with any other bank. So that is always the starting point. Beyond that, of course, you need to make a determination as to whether the business has the capacity to service the facility going forward and so on and so forth. So, a damn right. I mean, the SDS and the likes are very critical to our credit sanctioning process. Mm. Mm. Uh, I've got two final questions for you to wrap up. Um, so, you talked about also uh, efforts to reduce your uh, uh, operating expenses. Do you have plans of uh, opening additional branches this year? Yes, of course. We are on track, as I mentioned earlier on. We'll be opening a UAB Center for Businesses mm -hmm. um, in Medina, um, I think in two weeks' time. Um, everything is set out. We are doing soft launch. People are there working. And that adds to your expenditure. It? Yes, it does. The thing is, we are not <laughs> going to stop investing in the business. Mm -hmm. We'll always be looking out for areas where we believe we are underrepresented mm -hmm. and where we want to get as close as possible to our customers. Mm -hmm. our, the chunk of our investments are going into the digital and technology yes. side, mm -hmm. making sure that we are fit for purpose and mm -hmm. customers can you know, do their own banking instead of coming to our banking halls. We want customers to conduct their banking transactions in the comfort of their homes, in their cars, in schools, at the dining table. Wherever you are, you must have a bank if you have a phone. And that is where UMB, we believe that we are very much in the... In 30 the seconds, uh, Mr. Wa, what's your... What's the... What's your medium to... No, what's your, what's your short term me, to, to medium term goal <laughs> for the bank? Yeah, I, we, we, are positioned, we have positioned the bank for growth. Mm -hmm. We are not looking back. And um, luckily for the bank, we have one of the, I mean, the best group of people that you can find in mm -hmm. terms of our talent. Yeah. You won't be asked what the best people in the market. So the bank is not just getting these results out of thin air. People have put their hands to the wheel. And um, shareholders should be uh, excited about the prospects yeah. that uh, uh, the next few years the bank will, 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 will. In fact, we are significantly going to outperform the market. Your time is up. Yeah. Thank, you <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Johnny White, the Chief Executive <laughs> of <laughs> Universal Merchant Bank, and uh, Kwame J. Ajivon is Chief Finance Officer, also of Universal Merchant Bank. You know, this is my space. I know. You I know. know. <laughs> when I come to your Your're bank. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for joining me in studio. And a big thank you to also my producers uh, for uh, the wonderful production. Just to inform you that the transport fares have been increased by 15% effective Thursday, 6th of April 2017. Now, the transport unions say they took into consideration several factors before arriving at the percentage increment. The increment was arrived at at a meeting on Monday between stakeholders such as the Ministry of Transport, the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, and the Ghana Road Transport Coordinating Council in Accra. That's all for Business Focus for this week. My name is Park Wissi Asari. Hopefully, same time next week, we'll see you for yet another edition of your favorite business analysis program. Stand by for News 360.